Well, the notes will be coming to you in just a minute. And my intention this morning is to make you feel very intelligent. Isn't that nice? I want you to feel like you're really a sophisticated Bible student. Now, the way we're going to do that is we're going to give you a paper that will have some Greek words on it. Doesn't that make you feel like you really are a better Bible student already? And really, that we're not going to practice going over those words, but that the intent of the message is for us to take what would seemingly be an insignificant part of the Bible. We're going to be looking at the introduction to the book of Second Peter. And if you look at it, you might think there's nothing in that. But the Bible is so incredibly rich and full that when you take the time, and now anybody can do it on the internet, you go to BibleGateway.com, and that's one of the great sites, and you go on that site and you can look up Greek, or maybe not that, but at least look up the English variation of words, and it's a great, great, great tool. That's really what I did. And I wanted to share with you some of those things. And I asked Aaron to post something out of the order. Did, were you able to get it? Ah, there it is. Look at that giant hole. You are looking at the second largest man-made hole in the world. Tons and tons. I couldn't imagine how many tons of dirt and rock and rubble have been excavated out of that hole. A lot of times people will ask me when they hear about what we're doing and where we spend our time and let me say our staff that works for the FBT club, they are exhausted by this time every year. And somebody might say, with what you're doing at the church, with all of the time and all of the effort and all of the money and energy, is it really worth it? If you look at that hole, that's found in Siberia, in Russia. Four months out of the year, it's a slippery, sloppy mess. The other eight months out of the year, it is bitter cold. So cold that they have to use jet engines to warm the ground in order to dig more of that dirt out. So cold that they say oil will freeze if it's not protected. Never heard of that. It's absolutely brutal, the working conditions. And here's the, the part that's interesting. At the end of the year, the product they pull out of that incredibly large hole would fill your three-quarter ton pickup truck, and that would be it. Somebody asks, is it worth all that to get just a pickup truck load of product? It is if what you're getting are some of the highest grade industrial and uh, cosmetic diamonds in the world. That big hole has harvested for the producers and the owners over $22 billion worth of diamonds. But they move tons of dirt to get those few diamonds. That's a great picture of what ministry is to be like. We don't measure by how many. We don't measure by how big the budget is. We measure by what we find. We're not making the diamonds. We are finding the diamonds. We do not make a born-again person. Really, that's the work that God does, and we are a part of finding them and introducing them to the, to the Savior. Peter was so concerned about that. He is at the end of his ministry. He's already been told by the Lord himself that he will die a martyr's death. And by this point, I'm sure Peter, with his personality, is ready for whatever comes. He has proved to all of the people who doubted him Remember when he denied the Lord three times? But he's the same one who stood up and preached and over 3,000 were saved. He was the one that opened the door to the Samaritans. He opened the doors to the Gentiles. I mean, this Peter is a leader in the church. 
We know from our perspective, looking back, that Peter kind of guided the church to the Jews, and Paul guided the church effort to the Gentiles. But they never were in competition. Oh, they had some disagreements. We read about those in Acts 15. But all those were important because they dealt with matters of the gospel. But as far as men with hearts, they had the same heart. Men with desire, they had the same desire. And men of effectiveness, they were both equally effective. Why? Not because of bottom numbers in their lives. How many people, how many miles, how many months, how many sermons. They were not successful because of those things. They were successful because they accomplished God's plan for their life. They fulfilled his will. So Peter is at the end. This will be the last time we hear from Peter. Just three short chapters. And you can see here that they have been divided. Now, of course, Peter did not write in chapters. He wrote just a short letter. We would consider it a very long letter. But we've divided it. And in the three chapters, we find these themes. Chapter 1, cultivation of Christ-like character. Well, that's an important theme. He wanted to share that with those people who were going through so much persecution. And chapter 2, he said the condemnation of false teachers. you got to watch out. They're always there. There are always people who try to take advantage of God's work, and they do it by gaining more and more and more attention and control. And let's face it, they do it by gaining more and more money. As Christian people, we are gullible because we want the best. We see the best. And sometimes there are people who will take advantage of that, false teachers. In chapter 3, his theme is, you can be confident. The Lord is going to return. And when he returns, he will keep every single promise that's been made, whether that promise was made in the Old Testament by the prophets, or whether it's the promise made by the Lord Jesus himself while he was here on this earth, every single promise will be fulfilled. We can be confident that Jesus is coming back. But speaking of that text, let's take a look at it. The introduction of the letter, seemingly we just read through it like, well, there's nothing in that, but I'd like to show you that the word of God is... is it. It not only demands, but it promises rich understanding if we take our times and just walk through it. It's sort of like the way kids go through museums. Have you ever been to a museum with a kid? They're gone, and where do they want to spend all their time? In the shop, buying cheap merchandise sent to us from overseas. We don't want to be like that when it comes to the Bible. We want to stop at every exhibit, read every sign, gain as much as we can in understanding and appreciation. So let's take a look at the letter. The letter says this. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord. Let's go ahead and start with that Greek. Oh, this will make us feel so intelligent. Somebody will say, what would you do this weekend? And just say, well, you know, I studied a little Greek on Sunday morning. That will impress everybody. And you see, it's the word slave. That's not a word we use in our conversations. When's the last time in giving your testimony you shared with somebody, I am a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ? But when we understand what this word means and how it carries, well, I think you'll appreciate it. And it is difficult to say what Peter said. But here's what the word means. It means somebody who was born into the household, who was owned by somebody else. And you see three points that I think are important. Number one, a slave is owned by the master. 
So Peter, by the use of that word, says, I have no rights. I have no expectations except to do whatever my Lord Jesus Christ wants me to do. I am a slave of Jesus Christ, owned by the master. The slave is also ordered by the master. The slave never says what our kids so often say. I just don't feel like it. I don't want to. A slave could never do that in this society. A slave knew that if he disappointed his master, the master could take his life. The master owned everything about the slave. So it was a given that if you said, I am a slave of the Lord Jesus, not only are you owned by him, but you are ordered by him. You have to do whatever he says. The third thing is what's really important that keeps us from being a, a disgraceful relationship, uh, a, a relationship that, that is a burden. The relationship between the slave and the master, at least when it comes to our Savior, is such that the slave... His greatest joy is honoring the master. The slave is owned by the master, ordered by the master, and the slave honors the master. In fact, in any situation, the Christian or the slave has but one question to ask, Lord, what will you have me to do? I've told you before, and I'll share it again because I think it's good advice. Uh, maybe not the first part. When the alarm goes off, I always hit the snooze. How many of you are, are people who hit the snooze? I love the snooze button. So I hit the snooze, but during that little bit of extra rest, before that starts, that alarm ringing makes me say something to the nature of this right here. What I say is, Lord, I don't know what this day is going to bring. I'm not sure who the people are that I will meet. I do know that I cannot trust in my own righteousness. It's failed me many, many times. So, Father, I desire to do your will. I'm asking that your Holy Spirit empowers me and fills me for doing your will this day. Now, I don't want to tell you how many times I've failed in that prayer. But that's the way I start the day. Because, listen, that is the Christian's only responsibility, is to say, here am I, Lord, speak to me. Show me what you want me to do. So Peter says, listen, I'm a slave. Not only that, Peter says, I'm an apostle. Well, we know Peter's lifestyle, lifestyle his life story as well. Peter was a great apostle. He was the leader chosen by Jesus to start the church, to lead the church, to be the evangelist for the church. Peter is the one who had the personality. He was a type A personality. He was ready to get up and go all the time. If he made a mistake, he made a great mistake. If there was success, it oftentimes involved great success. So you know stories, Peter, uh, the Peter story, let me get that right. But here's something that I think that all of us can really appreciate. He said to the people that he's writing to, some that he never met before, he said, listen, the faith you have is the exact same faith that I have. When it comes to the economy of God's family, Peter is not higher than us. Peter does not get more attention than any of us. He is not loved any more than we are loved. He is not respected any more than what we are respected. And can I say this as well? The Lord does not expect any more out of Peter than he expects out of us. He expects our devotion. So Peter said, listen, I'm a slave and I'm proud to tell everybody. And then he says to these people, listen, the faith that I have as the apostle, the faith that I have as the leader of the new church 
it's the same faith that you share in. I found that very encouraging. There are not levels in God's family. There are not favorites over here who get more of God's blessings. No, we are all loved the same, honored, respected the same. But true faith that saves one's soul includes at least three main elements. And we see these in Peter's life. And I trust you'll be able to look and see them in your life as well. This faith that Peter says is the same faith that I have. It's the faith that you enjoy. It will at least do these three things. Number one, true faith changes the way we think. It changes the way we think. There's an onslaught. Every show you watch, Beth and I were watching a show that looked interesting. We watched, I think, four episodes, and we thought, those are interesting characters. And guess what happened on the fifth episode? The character, out of the blue, kisses another woman, a female, kisses another woman right on the main streets of Los Angeles. And Beth's first words were, you knew that was coming. That's the world we live in. There is a propagation. I mean, there is a, there's an effort on the part of this world to change the way we think. Every avenue of media is directed to changing the way our kids think. We've got to be careful. This is the book that determines what we hold to be valuable. This is the book that determines what is truth. Be careful. That, that faith that we have is the first filter, and it changes the way we think. Not only that, this true faith that Peter is talking about, it changes the way we feel. Because of that, my devotion is increased, my devotion for the, the Savior, my devotion for the church. My devotion to my kids, to my spouse, to my friends, to my community. This faith that Peter says we all have a part in, it changes the way we feel. It changes what's important to us. Number three, this true faith changes the way we act. It changes my life. I am convicted about certain habits and certain ideas and certain thoughts, and I turn away from those. I mean, a part of me wants to enjoy that, of course. But there's the other part that says, no, my faith demands that I make decisions on a daily basis, that I change the way I think, feel, and behave. You can see there, that we put it down like this, true faith changes my head, it changes my heart, and it changes what my hands do. Wow, what a great faith that we have and share with Peter. The next line, number three, it says, this faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. Of the justice is this idea, if it's from a root word that means straightness. It refers to a state that conforms to an authoritative standard. If we would give to our primary students downstairs, they would all know what a straight line is. If we said, listen, here's a long piece of paper, a 14-inch piece of paper, draw a straight line all the way across that paper, you know what the lines would look like. They'd go up and down and go who knows where they might be. But if you put a ruler on that, that's how you draw a straight line. Our efforts in our self-righteousness is as crooked and up and down and off-center as the writing of those little preschoolers. Jesus is the standard. So that's important. He says, this Jesus that we serve. The faith was given to you because of his righteousness, his straightness, his standard, and fairness. Now, this is a funny word that's thrown in there. It's a word that talks about getting a fair price for what you're paying. That's an interesting word to be thrown into this, and really, it would be summarized something like this. Jesus is more than able 
to do all the things that he's promised. And he is more than fair to everybody. He is able and willing to give this great salvation to any and every person. Now that's important because you have people on your list and you're saying God will never speak to their hearts. They're too far gone. They're so angry every time I bring up matters of faith, they'll never respond to the Lord. May I say to you that there have been literally millions of people who were just like that, and the Holy Spirit of God convicts them of their sin and convinces them of their need for a Savior. Yes, Jesus is able and more than willing to reach anybody, and that should motivate us in our desire to see lost people saved. He is able. He is willing. Number four, our God and Savior. Just read through this, and I know it's going to make you feel so intelligent, but if you look at it, it's really important. In the Greek, there is only one definite article. None of us even know what that means, do we? Modifying both God and Savior, a construction which demands that we translate it as our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you discern the importance of of such a seemingly small detail? Peter is teaching the indubitable, which means impossible to doubt, unquestionable, divine nature of Jesus Christ. That's what we're taught. That's what we believe. That's what has changed everything. Jesus, the Son of God, went to Calvary. It's beyond our ability to understand. But the more we think and dwell on it, we should begin to appreciate it more and more every single day. Number five, grace and peace. Grace is God's free, unmerited favor bestowed on guilty man in and through Jesus Christ by faith. Peace, in its literal meaning, meaning, is the binding or joining together what is broken or divided, thus setting the divided parts at one again. Broken bone, what do you do? You go to the doctor, he sets it, he binds it, he, he puts it back in place, maybe with a pen or a plate, and over time, that broken bone becomes stronger than ever. That's the idea. This idea that God has given to us his peace. He's given to us his grace. Now, sometimes we think peace, oh, you don't know my circumstances. They've changed everything. Well, let me just say, if you were given a $100 bill and you shoved it deep into your pocket, it's down there, it can't fall out. It's down in your pocket, deep into your pocket. You're on a nice boat ride in the lake and all of a sudden there's a storm and you get, you get thrown into the lake. Now you're rescued, thankfully. And you might think, oh no, oh no, my life is ending. It's the worst day of my life. But the truth is, do you still have the hundred dollar in your pocket? It's there whether you're dry and happy in the boat or wet and desperate in the water. That's the kind of peace that God gives to us. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. This peace is a gift that he gives. And notice what it says here, that it, as you grow in your grace, it increases. The understanding, the appreciation of this grace and peace that we have been given, the longer we live, but not in the sense of just years, but the longer we live in the sense of experiences. I know more now than I knew 10 years ago, 20, 30, 40, I can't even say it, 50 years ago. I know more now than I did then that what Jesus gave me because I came to Calvary is more valuable than I ever imagined. It has been with me, it has carried me, this grace and this peace has been with me and it has carried me through circumstances that I could never have imagined. That's what Peter is saying. He says, listen, hear the words that I'm writing to you. 
because what I have been through and what I have gained through this life experience is so valuable, I want to share it with you. So here's the conclusion. It's pretty simple. Read your Bible. If you want to grow in grace, if you want to grow in your peace, you cannot do it without reading your Bible. I was reading today. This is a chronological edition divided up by daily readings. And I was reading today, and as I read it, I thought, this is the perfect word for me to hear this Sunday morning. Because the Bible has this incredible ability to to point exactly into our hearts and to give us the encouragement we need. Not only that, we are to reflect on its meaning and application. We're to meditate on the Bible. Think about it. What does it want me to do? What is it asking me to do in regards to my life? How should I change the way I think, feel, and do, head, heart, and hand? Remember to put all of it into practice. That's the next important step. Lord, show me, and when the Lord shows you, then you have the responsibility with the the empowerment that is his given to you. It is your responsibility to make the decision and do it. Some time ago, I was talking to a young person and I said, I'll do this for you. If you'll just walk in a straight line for more than 10 steps, because they would go this way. And then they'd go that way. And then their life would go in this direction and this direction. There's a certain responsibility we have to just go in a straight line. Say, Lord, show me what you want me to do. And when the Lord shows us, then we do it. To read the Bible, reflect on its meaning and application. Remember to put it all into practice. And number four is so important. Recite to others how God is working in your life through his word. I don't mean become preachy, never to become self-righteous. But if you have an opportunity and you feel like I ought to share with somebody what I read today, you will be absolutely amazed if you make Bible reading a daily practice in your life, reading it with the desire to be obedient that the Lord's going to give you opportunities to counsel and to encourage other people. They'll say something, and you're going to say, I just read about that yesterday. And you'll have an opportunity to say, listen, you know, I was reading in the Bible yesterday, and it talked about the very feeling, the very situation that you're going through. Here's what God told me. Here's what God taught me. By simply reading and understanding and applying the Bible. Peter says, listen, what I want to share with you is so important. I write to you not as an apostle, but as an apostle and a slave. As one who shares in all of the same things that you share in. In one that has been blessed in all the same ways that God desires to bless you. Here's what I want you to say. My final words. And that's where we're going to begin. Well, I appreciate you listening to the introduction. And next week we'll begin. Well, yeah, next week we'll begin that. Father, we're thankful. We are. We're blessed. We are. We ask for all of this again in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. Forgive me of those extra couple of minutes. I set the clocks. They're probably wrong. You're probably early on dismissal. Hey, grab some coffee and stay around and visit with some people you haven't seen for a while. Thank you. God bless you guys.